Christoph, most neuroscientists would believe something that would be called an identity theory of sorts, where the brain and the mind are largely the same thing in terms of the, the, the feelings we have in the mind, so-called consciousness, and the electrical chemical activities of the brain are two aspects of the same theory. There's nothing else we have to postulate in the universe. We may not know how it happens, but there's no reason to suppose some uh, super physical stuff or some spooky spiritual stuff. Where do you classify yourself? So I guess I don't like these philosophical terms because they shoehorn you, they constrain you in sort of now I have to believe something and don't believe something else. So I'm a scientist and I like to believe that I go where the evidence leads me. So yes, it's true that there's a very close intimate relationship between brain or parts of my brain and my consciousness. I know this because when you get a strong blow to your head, you lose consciousness. And we know this through thousands of experiments. There's a very close link. If my brain goes offline, my mind goes offline. But it turns out many parts of my brain do not relate directly to my mind. I can lose parts of my brain, like my spinal cord, and I, I'll be paralyzed, but my mind won't be affected that much. I'll still be conscious. I can lose a um, large part. In fact, I can lose 80%, four to five of my neurons, uh, which are in this part of the brain called the cerebellum, and I, may, I might not be able to dance or to climb anymore because I'll be very klutzy and, and sort of look like I'm drunk, but my consciousness won't be impaired. So we know that, that the relationship is a, is a whole lot more complicated. And many people, it is true, many of my colleagues believe that we don't need any additional thing, that there's a very clear and ambiguous relationship between the two and we can explain consciousness as arising out of the mind without needing any new concepts. I also used to think that for the longest. Um, but you know, that concept, consciousness is an emergent property. That uh, consciousness is an emergent property, but uh, but but the question is, um, do you need any other? Do you, do you need to postulate anything in addition to explain this this unique thing? I mean, after all, experiences are so radically different from anything else in the universe. My experience of blue is not the same as the brain state that gives rise to blue, or my experience of a toothache. We know is you know that. That, that's closely linked to some neurons in part of my brain firing when I have this toothache. But they're not the same thing, and they, there's this huge explanatory gap between. On the one hand, that's the physics of the situation. You have, you have ions that slosh around in the brain, sodium, potassium ions, that give rise to this conscious, sen that, that give rise to this conscious sensation. But the sensation, how, how, how can mere physics give rise to, con to, to, to sensation, to feelings? That's the fundamental, that's sort of the heart of the mind-body problem. And one way to resolve that is to say, well, there's space and time and energy and mass, but there's also something called experience. It's a fundamental feature of the universe, and it's linked to certain specific states of particular types of system in a very lawful way. So this is not like a soul. It has a, it has a substrate, and if that substrate disappears, the, the mm -hmm. consciousness will also disappear, <laughs> and it's linked to that substrate, but it's not the same as a substrate. It's something additional. But, but you're saying that experience, this word, you just kind of toss it off, is, is the same as matter and energy, space and time? No, 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 no. It's not the same, but it's, but it's as a, fundamental. It's as fundamental. I, I, I mean the same in its fundamental nature, yes. irreducible. Yes, yes, irreducible. Well, it's, well, it's shocking from a, for a scientist, isn't it? Well, no, but, but if you think about it, Robert, the most fundamental aspect of your life, the only way you know anything in your life is because you experience your pain, your pleasure, you hear me, you listen to yourself, you have memories. Those are all conscious that's sensations. that's very, very higher order. No, your, your feeling of pain is in higher order. Your feeling of nausea is in higher order. Your feeling waking up in a hotel room, being desynchronized, you don't know where you are on the planet's face. That's a conscious sensation. And that's fundamental to your life. And the only way you know about anything is because of those conscious sensations. All, all, all agree. But, but those are just uh, uh, higher level activities of all my brain activity. And I'm, I'm imagining that that's important, and it is important to me, but, but how can you say that's at the fundamental level of the structure of the universe, like the fundamental, that, that you can't reduce that experience to, to, to some physical Well, terms. right now at least we have no idea. So consciousness is not part of the foundational equation of physics. It's not part of general relativity or quantum mechanics. It's not to be found in the periodic table of chemistry. It's not to be found in the endless ATG GC charters mm -hmm. of our genes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it somehow emerges out of that. Yes. I mean, that's true. Right. But, but in order to have a complete view of the universe, we have to explain how it emerges. And right now it's utterly unclear how it emerges, I believe, until you postulate something fundamental. You see, certain types 
parts of system, in addition to having all their usual physical properties, they have these conscious experience. My brain and your brain being, being two examples of, of, um, uh, of that. Certainly, we have a radical view where most brain scientists would say that consciousness is an emergent property. We don't know exactly how, but it's a pure emergence. We don't need any new special laws. And then there are many philosophers who say that in principle, we're never going to explain it at all because those brain scientists don't understand at all this explanatory gap. They, they're just clueless about philosophy. And the scientists say, you know, the best thing philosophers could, could do is to keep the other philosophers away from me. So, <laughs> so we have these radical views, and you're taking a, diff a different view than both of them, actually. Yeah, I don't take this defeatist view seriously of the philosopher because they've said, many philosophers have said the same thing about life, that okay, we cannot okay. explain life, we need new laws. And, but ultimately, my view is informed by, 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 by empiricism. So the, the, the theories, like, like the one I was, uh, I was mentioning, um, that, that postulate that consciousness arises out of certain, certain types of complex systems, they can be put to the test. They can make specific predictions which systems are conscious, which one is not conscious. In principle, they allow you to build a conscious meter that tells me a particular system, a particular brain that might be in coma, is or is not conscious. So it makes specific prediction, and that's ultimately what it's about. It has to be, we have to have a theory that's not only metaphysics, but that makes some prediction yeah, okay. that we can then okay. test and evaluate. Okay, that's very exciting, actually, if, if you can make any progress along those lines, because many philosophers say that, that in principle you can't even make progress because you don't even know what a theory could even be. But you're now saying that you have an idea of at least what a theory could be. It may or may not be right, but that's a big step if that's true. Yeah, I think over the last 20 years, there has been significant pro uh, progress in this nascent field of consciousness science. But you still need to postulate experience, your word, as something fundamental. I do believe that's uh, necessary, uh, correct. Okay, so, so then how do you go to the next step? I mean, how do you, how do you try to um, describe this experience? What, 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 are, what are the constituent parts of it? What's the uh, experience on? Uh, as opposed to a you know graviton or so, what what is the 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 the, the uh, fundamental core particle of experience? All right, so this is the the the, the theory that, that that I'm talking about was um, discovered or invented by a neuropsychiatrist and a and a signed a PhD MD Julio Tononi at University of Madison. So he postulates that that the two fundamental aspects of consciousness and many philosophers have said the same thing. It's a I can integrate a huge amount of information when I'm, when, whatever I'm conscious of, I'm conscious as a whole. It's integrated information, it's holistic. I look at you, I'm conscious of you, I cannot, for example, see you in black and white. I cannot do that. I cannot just see when I'm conscious of you, I cannot apprehend only the left part of you, only the right part of you. I, 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 I have a unitary experience of you. This is one of the constituent hallmarks of, con of consciousness. The other one, that consciousness is immensely rich. If you think about the frames of every movie that I've ever seen, if you think about every movie that's ever been made, each frame constitutes a unique visual experiences. And then there are all the auditory and pain and sensory and, and you know, gustatory experiences, okay? So consciousness at once is hugely differentiated and it's also integrated. You can take that seriously and sort of leave the domain of, of metaphysics and say, okay, let's tie that down to mathematics. Let's look at a, at a calculus that tells us when is something highly differentiated. We can do that in information mm -hmm. theory. So for instance, my disk, my, my, my hard disk on my iPhone or my, or my computer is highly differentiated. To be correct, it has 16 gigabytes worth of differentiated states. I can count those. They're not very integrated because right now, for example, my iPhone do doesn't has no knowledge that those bits are actually photograph, or it might know it's an image, it's a JPEG image, but it doesn't know that the picture conveys in, in the identity of a particular individual, my daughter. And it doesn't know that the entries in my diary on my, on my, on my calendar refer to my meeting that lady, that young lady, my daughter, right? So none of that information is integrated. Now, if you look at it as a human, you can immediately see it and you can, inter you, you can look at an, an image, you can immediately tell so many things about that image because you have access to that information in this holistic way. You know it's a woman, you know her age, you know her ethnicity, you can probably venture to guess where it was taken, it, in, in what locality, etc. Computers right now don't have that. So, so, so then you can take this calculus and cast it into mathematical form, and then you can begin to test it, well, how does this apply to the circuits of the mind that we know are involved in generating consciousness? Let's look at those circuits. Let's look at a particular part of the brain and see, does it have this integrated information? Does it, um, how does it compare with, the, with this calculus that I can do that, that, uh, that, that comes from the theory? So uh, what are the implications of that? 
Well, the implication says that in principle, it gives me a recipe for telling what, what type of networks are conscious. Why are certain types of networks not conscious? The cerebellum, for instance, does not appear to be um, uh, to give rise to consciousness, although it has um, more than 80% of the neurons in my head. The spinal cord doesn't appear to be gener uh, generating consciousness. Even my retina, if you think about it, I don't see with my eyes. My eyes are necessary for see, but I can close my eyes. I can still imagine you sitting there. And of course, I, tonight I'm going to go to sleep. I close my eyes in the dark and I have very vivid visual experiences without my eyes closed. For, so for, for many reasons, we know that the eyes might be necessary for normal forms of seeing, but that's not where actually my conscious visual, if we talk about visual consciousness for a moment, happens. My sense of red does not take place in the retina, it takes place, it occurs in the higher part of the brain. So I can systematically analyze which parts of the brain are, ge are actually generating, actually causally necessary um, to generate a con any one conscious experience. And then again, I can compare that with the, with the prediction of the, um, of the theory. Does this theory, so this theory predicts that you need a certain amount of complexity measured in this way. It needs to be differentiated and integrated, and Tononi calls it integrated, so his theory is called Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness. It has a number, phi. It measures how much integrated information, it's a real number, it's a number in bits, so you can say, well, this system has 20 bits and this system has 10,000 bits, so it's not something ephemeral, it's actually something you can measure. I give you the wiring diagram, I see all these complex interactions, and I can, in principle at least, evaluate and say, okay, this system has so many bits of information, and that relates to how many different, so, um, what is uh, its, its conscious repertoire? How many different conscious experiences can it have? And what is the ilk? What is the type of conscious experience? Because after all, a color is very different from a pain, is very different from falling in love. Those are three distinct conscious states. They each have very different feelings, right? You know, we're never going to confuse pain with falling in love, although sometimes one may <laughs> fall the other. But, but um, and the theory in principle gives different answer to those because you, you can construct, the theory allows you to construct sort of, um, it has a geometrical part and it has an algebraic part and you can construct sort of different geometries like crystals. You can essentially assign to each network in a particular state when these neurons are firing and those neurons are off, this gives rise to a high dimensional structure in this very high dimensional state. You can think of it like a crystal and the shape of this crystal constitutes your conscious experience. So here you would have sort of the the, the, the algebra of integrated information is turned into the geometry of experiences. And it's all brain-based. It's a particular network that gives rise to a particular type of experience. And you have a different experience because your, your brain is in a different state. You will have a different crystal that's shaped different. There will be a different experience. It might be experience of color versus experience of pain. So it is, it is, it is very precise and it allows you to make precise predictions.